Hey everybody, this is Kai Werner from Confluent. Today I want to discuss with you if Apache Kafka can replace a database. So we will take a look at Kafka's capabilities and trade-offs for storage, queries, processing, transactions and connectivity. So this is not really a talk to pitch Apache Kafka, but to show you what it can do very well, what it can do good, but often not good enough, and very simply another database is the better choice. So I hope you learned something from this talk. And actually this discussion happened before and was answered with yes, so Kafka is a database. Of course, it always depends on how you define it, but it is, for example, exit compliant. And also, since that talk from Martin a few years ago at a Kafka Summit keynote, many things changed. So we will see new features like tiered storage, for example, which make it even more a database approach. So just to have that in mind, this is a very technical discussion about Kafka. I will go a little bit on an upper level to more talk about the use cases and where Kafka is a good fit and where it's not. So in short, yeah, absolutely, Kafka is a database. You can store data, you can query, you have transactions. So that's the easy part, right? But the big question is if it can also be used for your use case or if you use, have to use another database or maybe combine Kafka with another database. So the agenda for today is to first define what I mean with a database and with Apache Kafka. This is super important because everybody means different things when he talks about this. And then we will take a look at these characteristics of a normal database like storage, queries, data processing, transactions, and integration with other systems and clients. And based on that, then you can make the decision not if Kafka is a database, but if Kafka is the right approach for your project. So let's begin with the definition of a database. And here's the first problem. I mean, there are so many databases, right? So on the right side, you see a few of the examples. I think the first one everybody really thinks about in the modern world is a SQL database management systems like a Oracle or a Postgres database. But then in addition to that, um, there's a lot of NoSQL stuff. Today, when you're in the cloud, many people think about S3 buckets as a native database and first approach you often use with a key value store. And then there is so many others like document stores and time series databases and so on. And also actually while they somehow have similar functions like storage and queries and transactions, in the end, every one of these approaches is very different and solves specific use cases. And that's really important to understand in the beginning. And with that, there come a lot of theorems about databases, like very well known as the exit theorem about atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And that's what the traditional databases took a look at, right? You want to do a transactional interaction so that the data is really stored and consistent. On the other side, with the upcoming phases in the big data area, the CUP theorem with consistency, availability and partitioning got much more important. Because you cannot do only transactions for big data sets. You have to find out the trade-offs of the real world and the physics and latency behind it and make the decision if maybe eventually consistent is good enough for your use case. And that's what a lot of NoSQL databases are today. But therefore, they can scale much, much better than a traditional SQL database. And this is really the foundation everybody should understand, at least on a high level, so that you can make the right decision for your projects. And based on that, then, we see a lot of these products here. Some are open source, some are only available under commercial license, some are only available as a cloud service, some, well, are not used for new projects anymore. Um, and so there's many different options here you can see. And uh, the, the funny part is, again, so um, when we talk about Kafka here and part of this picture, many people might be surprised because actually Kafka is mainly thought about to being used for event streaming and processing data while it's in motion. So continuously processing real-time data. And that's actually, yeah, that, that's the, the, the key piece of Kafka why many people use it today. But as we will see today, Kafka has a lot of characteristics where you can also use it as a database or even as a data lake. Not for every use case, as we will discuss, but for many examples, you don't need yet another database or data lake. So let's be more clear here. What do I mean with Apache Kafka? 
And that's really the key point. It's a platform for data in motion. So as I said before, it's for processing real-time data. At the beginning, many people only thought about Kafka as a messaging platform. So send data from A to B and C with publish, subscribe. And that's still very valid and a key characteristic of it. And it's possible to scale it to process millions of messages per second or even gigabytes of seconds per Kafka cluster. So that's what we do in Confluent Cloud, for example, for some customers. But in addition to that, Kafka also has the storage piece. So the heart of it is also using a storage. And the big advantage of this is it can handle slow consumers and do real decoupling of systems. And on the other side, it is also possible to decouple the producers and the consumers. That's something which you cannot really do with a messaging queue or with web services. But then on top of this core of messaging and storage, Kafka also has Kafka Connect for data integration with the connectors. And this provides capabilities to continuously process data in motion with Kafka streams and stream processing. So this is really what I mean with Kafka. So it's a lot more than just a messaging system. Yeah, well, and I mean, the rise of data in motion is here, right? So Kafka was created over 10 years ago. So it's pretty mature and battle tested. And of course, still gets new features all the time. But then especially after Confluent was founded seven years ago to make Kafka enterprise ready, we really now see an adoption of event streaming and processing data in motion. So this number of 80% of Fortune 100, that's the official number. But in reality, I think it's more like 90, 98% of Fortune 100 or even Fortune 1000 companies trust and use Apache Kafka and across very different projects. So that's great. And now, however, let's also understand what it is not or um, how to compare it to other systems. That's also important before you go on with the database discussion. Because until now you might think, well, there is other tools for that. And there is ETL tools, right? Which you can also use for moving data and for processing them and storing them. So ETL tools and data integration tools exist for 20 plus years. And they were built to process high volumes of data and they are durable and persistent. But the problem is, this is built for batch processing. And also, typically, it's pretty expensive to buy these kind of tools. And on the other side, of course, for 20 plus years, we also have real-time messaging systems, which can process events in milliseconds, or at least send it from A to B in milliseconds. But actually, they unfortunately, therefore, don't scale. So they were not built for thousands or millions of messages with one broker. And also, it's not about persistence, so you cannot easily, easily decouple systems and replay data later from a batch system. And the beauty about Kafka now more from a, a middleware perspective is that it combines the characteristics of ETL tools and former messaging and MQ systems. So it's real time, but also for high scale and it's durable. And now this is how I explain people to Kafka in the beginning typically. So this is how we think about Kafka for processing data in motion and this event streaming platform. But what's now interesting, it's used for more and more use cases, right? So, I mean, not just for messaging and ingestion into Hadoop, but also, for example, to replace existing middleware, building new business applications. And a key piece of that very often is to store data longer in Kafka to use it also as a persistent system and not just to decouple producers and consumers, but also to consume data later. But in parallel also to build transactional systems for the most critical data you process. And therefore, here's just a few examples of different use cases for Kafka. My main point is here, it's used across industries and for many, many different kind of use cases. And a key piece of that is because Kafka is not just a messaging system, but also uses a persistent distributed storage under the hood. And with this now, this is now the perfect discussion about, well, is Kafka database or not? And so we will start with the probably most important character of a database, the storage system. How is the data stored? How is it persistent? Well, and if you know Kafka, you know that already, but just to, to have everybody um, on the same page, Kafka stores the data in a distributed commit log. That's the storage system. And again, the benefit is not just that it really decouples the systems from each other, but also that different consumers can consume the data when they need it. 
and this can be a real-time system consuming data directly from the memory in Kafka, but some others might consume it later from the storage. So this is applications which either get it in batch mode, like a batch uh, MapReduce process from Hadoop or Spark, which only runs overnight or every hour. Or on the other side, this can be a data scientist who trains an analytic model on the, day, on the events of the last 30 minutes or 30 days, and he consumes all the historical data from Kafka. And the great thing is, in this commit log, it's appended only, so you cannot change data after it's there. And with that, you have guaranteed ordering and timestamps and con can consume all the historical data from a Kafka log. So that's the main foundation of it as a storage. And this is, of course, also a distributed system to be highly available, even if nodes go down or disks crash or all these things. So this uses the common patterns of distributed systems in a similar way like other databases. Yeah, well, and there's many different examples. So here's two very different ones for storing your data durably. On the left side, you see the New York Times example. That's actually pretty famous in the Kafka world because it's out there so long. So the New York Times stores every single article ever published since 1851. And Kafka is the single source of truth for these articles. And different can consumers can consume that. And this can either be um, by consuming all the articles or just some of them from some months, or also, for example, using a key value query to get a specific article. So there's different options how to store all data, but at the heart of it is Kafka. And on the right side, you see another example from Twitter. So this is their account activity replay API they have built to recover events that were not delivered for different reasons. And this is also based on Apache Kafka because it has exactly this benefit you need for a Twitter stream. So you have all these events and guaranteed ordering and can consume them from a, partition, a specific partition or um, by a specific key if you, for example, use compacted topics. And so there's many different examples of how to do that. But the point is here that Twitter stores the data directly in Kafka. And here it's not about years like New York Times, but here it's more about days or weeks. But still it's persistent and durable and highly available and guaranteed ordering. And that's why these are two examples where Kafka works very well as storing the events as a single source of truth for the consumers. And this actually got even better these days. So today, confluent tiered storage for Kafka is available. And this means that you don't have to worry anymore how much data you store in Kafka. In the past, many people store and process data with Kafka for a few hours or days or weeks, but then they ingested it into another data lake like Hadoop or an object store because it simply got too expensive to store all the data in Kafka on the brokers because there you store it on disks like an HDD or SDD or maybe something like an EBS volume in AWS. So this gets expensive when you have terabytes or petabytes of data, obviously. And on the other side, it also is hard to scale because, for example, if a broker is down and you have to start a new instance of a disk and broker, well, then you need to synchronize and replicate all of this data. And if that's terabytes or more, then this can take hours and impact your system because then other consumers might fail behind, fall behind. And hence, the tiered storage approach offloads most of the data into an object store. So you can see this as hot data on the broker and cold data in the object store. And this is really super important because with this, you on the one side have cheap object storage where you can store terabytes and petabytes of data, like you know it from another data lake. Today, Hadoop and Spark and all these systems also use an object store under the hood instead of HDFS. And the other benefit is also the scalability is much easier because when you have things like adding brokers or doing rebalancing, you only need to take a look at the partitions in the brokers, not the object store, which is typically like 99% of the data. And the other important advantage is there is no impact on the clients, so the applications which consume the data. They still use the same API like before, so there is no breaking changes. Because from a client perspective, you don't even know that there is a tiered storage under the hood. That's built into the system, including things like high availability and no data loss. And that's obviously not easy to implement, right? But that's we build it as a product and, and ship it as part of our platform. 
From a community perspective, this is also interesting because um, there is also a KIP, a Kafka improvement proposal, so to add tiered storage to Kafka, the open source project. And there is actually active work on this for a long time now. And while I'm talking here in March 2021, there is also a lot of um, PRs and, and uh, features which already merged into the Kafka trunk. And so Confluent is working on that together with other companies and committers and, and from the community. And actually Uber has the lead on this. And in the end, the goal is that Apache Kafka gets an interface for tiered storage as part of the official Kafka version. And then different implementations and options for tiered storage will be available. So you have seen Confluent tiered storage in the last um, page already, which provides interfaces to different object stores like S3 or Google Cloud Storage or also on-premise object stores like Pure Storage or MinIO for Kubernetes. But then also, for example, Uber is implementing an HDFS implementation for that. So I think this is really great news, also from a community perspective. So when we talk about storage in Kafka, there is more to know. A very important concept is log compaction with compacted topics. So this actually means that you don't store all the events long term, but only retain the last known value for each message key. And so here it's important how you define your messages. So a message is always a key and a value and headers in Kafka. And so, for example, if you have a customer application, you can store all events for one customer with one key, which is the ID of the customer. And based on that, you can always update the information about the customer, like storing the address of the customer or the payment information. And when the customer updates it from the web application, you, for example, just update the address which is stored for the customer. And so this is therefore, as the name says, much more compacted. And um, this also has no retention time, so this is stored forever. And the big benefit here is also you can easily look this up with a key value query. You just query for a key like a customer ID and get all the information for that key. And so this is in the end what you define as a database in many cases, right? And this is great. And this is built into Kafka. However, there's even more when we think about Kafka because Kafka is not just the brokers and the server side. Kafka provides client applications which are also scalable and real time and process data in motion but they also keep state in their application without the need for another external database. So in case of Kafka Streams and NKSQL DB, both of these stream processing frameworks, which are Kafka native tools leveraging Kafka under the hood, they have an interface under the hood to keep storage. Out of the box, both use RocksDB, a key value store, but you can even replace that with another database embedded into the Kafka client. But in 99% of cases, it's RocksDB because it um, works well and is exactly the right choice here. And with this in mind, it's not just about the Kafka brokers, which have durable storage, which you can query like with the compacted topics. But it's also about the clients where you keep state and storage in there. And, and this is also very different than how you can think about building applications with, with durable state. So what you should always ask yourself when you build streaming applications with Kafka clients, do you really need another database for your application or microservice? Because in the, in the, in the old world, um, people often used REST APIs and web services to do the communication. And then they had some business logic in a Java class or something like that. And then they stored it into a database like MySQL or Mongo or something like that. This is still a valid approach for many use cases. But you should always ask yourself, do I really need this? Or is it good enough to have Kafka, not just for the business logic, but also for the storage? And you will be surprised in many cases it's good enough, but it really simplifies your architecture and, and the operations overhead. And with all that in mind now, um, we see more and more customers which are using Kafka as a single source of truth, where you produce an event from one source and then different consumers can consume the data. And often Kafka here um, is not just a single source of truth, but really a leading system because it's durable. It's like any other database. You can store the data there long term without a retention time. 
And the data will not be lost because it's a replicated distributed system, highly available. And the huge benefit of that is then that you have a real decoupling between the, the producers and the consumers. And also the other big benefit is that the consumers can consume the data when they are ready for that. So with this, you automatically handle the back pressure and slow consumers. Like in this example with an order service, one event might be the fraud detection application. This has to process the data in real time in milliseconds because you want to detect the fraud before it happened. On the other side, you also want to store the data in a database or you want to use it for a batch job for analytics. And this typically doesn't happen in milliseconds, but more like in, in a slower way. And this is totally okay because Kafka is here the leading system for that. And also to be very clear here, um, if you integrate with other applications like an ERP system like SAP or so, then often still that system is the leading system, right? From a high level perspective, it has the full control over what they are defining, but then they push it into Kafka and then other applications consume it from Kafka a single source of truth, while the ERP system on the left side is still the leading system of the data with the most recent information. So as you see, storage in Kafka, that's many different things. And with that often it's good enough for being a database. Let's now talk about queries and processing in Kafka. That's of course also important. Often um, data stored in Kafka or any other database is only relevant if you can also access it later. Not just in real time, but also later when you want to do new queries. The beauty about Kafka is that it really decouples storage and compute from each other. That's a similar approach like you see, for example, um, in, a, in a cloud data warehouse like Snowflake, which is pretty successful for the, exactly this reason. They do designed um, the data warehouse in the cloud from the beginning, and they have a, a great decoupling between storage and compute. And the similar thing is happening for Kafka, more for data in motion instead of data in, at rest like in Snowflake. But here the Kafka cluster is just there for storage. It doesn't know anything about the data. It's just storing byte arrays on disk or in the tiered storage approach. All the compute is happening in the client applications. And the client application can be anything. So on the left side, you see a few stream processing applications with KSQL that can also be stateful, not just stateless. But on the other side, you can also attach other applications like a monolithic application, which is using any kind of technology or third party product to do other compute there. Or in the case like on the bottom right, where you have now the cloud data warehouse like Snowflake, you can ingest it into that data warehouse or data lake. And here, of course, then you also have other storage because then you want to store it long term in the data warehouse to run your reports on top of that. So if you use Kafka as a storage system, it doesn't mean that you don't need any other storage. Like in the example of Snowflake, of course, there's other storage systems and there is always trade-offs between how long you want to store your data and what data you want to store in what system. So in this example, it might make sense to ingest all the data or all the aggregated data into a data warehouse and, or data lake. And you probably don't want to store all the data in Kafka. But for example, if you have data which you know you want to process later in an event-based manner, like customer interactions or payments or specific logs you want to analyze later for compliance reasons, well, that's where Kafka is the perfect storage for that, even long-term. So when we now talk about querying the data and processing it, that's super important because in Kafka, there is two different approaches. On the one side, um, if we go to the right side, this is the pull approach. This is what you know from your traditional SQL or NoSQL database. You have data stored at rest, and then you have a client application which queries some of the data with a command line interface or with a SQL query or with a mobile app. This is the pull-based approach where clients request data. On the other side in Kafka, you also have the push-based processing where you continuously process data in motion and then you can also of course forward it either to another Kafka topic or to some other database afterwards. So these are the two important approaches. In Kafka by nature everything is moving data and processing continuously. But also the pull approach is more and more important when you think about using Kafka as a database. 
where you just want to query some of the data from time to time. So the great thing is that Kafka supports both, both out of the box. And here's an example for that with KSQL DB. This is the event streaming database. And this means that you connect this to a Kafka cluster and then on your one side, you can do push queries, which means you continuously process data while the data is in motion. And on the other side, you can also look up data once with a query, like you know it from another database. And so here in KSQL DB, you have both these approaches. And that's the great benefit of that. Here's an example for that. So on the left side, you have a payment stream. So this is how you think about Kafka normally. You have a stream of events and continuously process them. In this case, it, each new payment is a new event appended to the log. However, on the right side in the application, here we also have business logic. And here we also keep state in the client application in the KSQL DB. In this case, for every stateless payment on the left side, which you append only to that log, you also update the credit score on the right side. So this is a stateful application where you keep the state in the client application. And this is still continuously updated in real time while a new payment is happening. But then of course, when this happened afterwards, you can still query the data with a pull query afterwards. So this is how you combine these technologies and concepts. Therefore, instead of just continuously processing the data with stream processing, of course, you can also use any kind of client or technology to consume data in Kafka. And this now can be either continuous consumption in real time, and this, like it was with KSQL before, this can be with any other Kafka client, and there is a Kafka client for any kind of language available, or even something like a REST proxy so that you can consume the data with HTTP. Or you can directly connect it to another Kafka cluster with something like Confluent cluster linking or Kafka's Mirror Maker 2. Or on the other side, instead of continuously replicating the data and consuming it, you can also just consume specific timeframes or partitions. Like you can say, give me all the data from the last 30 days. I want to run a batch process on that. Or you can get all data from the beginning. So that's up to you what kind of data you want to consume from the log. But this is still more in many cases like a pull query, right? Where you say, give me some historical data. And there's plenty of use cases why people do consume historical events from Kafka and not just the real-time applications. On the bottom right, you see a few of these examples. So the ones I see most actually are about compliance and regulatory processing. And here again, especially in combination with tiered storage, it's so easy to store data long-term in Kafka and still you're able to consume all data in a guaranteed ordering with timestamps. And that's perfect if you want to analyze some compliance issues to prove what happened in the last year or something like that. And the other use case I see more and more is about machine learning, where you consume historical data to train analytic models with tools like TensorFlow. So in the past, everybody ingested the data via Kafka into another data lake like Hadoop. And then the model training was executed against the data in the data lake. This is still a valid approach. But again, you should ask yourself, do I need that other data lake anymore? Or can Kafka actually be my data lake? And especially with tiered storage, it can be the data lake for some use cases like model training. Because tools like TensorFlow, they also have a Kafka connector, so you can consume the data from the Kafka log and train the model based on that. There are still other approaches where the data lake is the better thing, the, the, the Hadoop, right? Or the, the, the Spark tools. If you want to do map reduce processing or shuffling or all these batch jobs, that's where Kafka is not the right tool for. That's where these batch processing tools were actually built for 10 years ago. And then there is even another option to query data in Kafka client. So that's interactive queries. And so this is in the end, uh, mapping back to the example I showed before about the payments. So on the one side, you have a continuous stream of processing payments. That's um, push queries, that's continuously flowing data in motion. But also while it's updated in real time, 
It's stored in the stream processing application under the hood. So it's also there, like you know it, at data at rest in a SQL database. And so from another application on the right side, which can be your mobile app, which connects to Kafka via HTTP, for example, you can get information via pull query out of the Kafka application. Also to be very clear here, and this is now the limitation of Kafka itself when you want to do this kind of use case. This is only possible with a key value query. So this is not for complex SQL queries like joins where you want to do very complex things with a pull query. That's not Kafka itself, right? So this is very important. So Kafka is not the silver bullet for every problem here. And it's not the goal to replace every database. But for these kind of interactive queries, which are good enough for many use cases, like give me the current value of the, of the payment information for a specific customer ID. That's where you don't need another database. Well, and then there is additional tools which can make this even better. Like if you run Kafka as your infrastructure, with third-party tools like Rockset, you can actually even do this kind of complex queries because Rockset has built an engine on top of Kafka to provide NC SQL. So this means really the normal, regular, standard-based SQL, which you execute against your Oracle or MySQL database on top of the Kafka data. And with that, you can also connect your favorite BI tools like Tableau or Powered BI or Click to that and create reports natively on the Kafka data. And in addition to doing just manual queries, you can also automate that and build automated scripts for these reports and analyzers. So this is a great example how you can use Kafka as your data store or data lake and still use your traditional tools like the BI APIs, which typically use NC SQL as interface. And so this is also very interesting um, approach to use Kafka's database and still um, um, use it like a traditional database, let's say. So we now understood that Kafka is actually working pretty well for storage and for queries and processing data with some limitations where you can also use other tools on top of Kafka. The other big part about databases typically is discussing transactions. As I said in the beginning, Kafka is not just used for big data use cases where it's about analytics and reporting. So that's sometimes where you run, for example, a Spark job in batch mode if you want to get a report at the end of the day. Many of the projects I see today are really about transactional data to process payments, to process orders, to handle fraud and these kind of things. So the good news is that Kafka also provides exactly one semantics. And this is available for many years already since Kafka 0.11. So a long time ago, this was created. There were huge discussions at that time if that's actually possible and working very well. So you can read a lot of these old blog posts, like here you see one from, from Neha from 2017 or also from Ben, where they explain in detail how this works and was implemented under the hood. The big point here, this is not transactions like you know it from an Oracle database. There is no two-phase commit implementation. That does not scale and is way too complex for these uh, systems which process data in motion at scale. So it has other concepts. But from a high level, the main point is that you can implement your business application. For each event like a payment which is produced once on a mobile app, you want to make sure that it's processed and consumed once, exactly once, from each consumer application, like the fraud detection app, the data lake ingestion, and so on. And this is possible and out of the box of Apache Kafka. And there is not even a big penalty on that for performance. So this is maybe then 10% slower than not using these transactional data sets. Well, and actually while it's not a two-phase commit protocol like in an Oracle database, you even have a transactions API in Kafka for that. And you can even not just process one event at a time, but like you see in the example on the left side, you can begin a transaction and then even send two different records to different Kafka topics and then commit the transaction. And like you know it from your two-phase commit protocol, this is either, exactly, either processed exactly once for both of these transactions or not processed at all because then it's rolled back. 
Don't ask me how this is implemented. I have no idea. It's super complex. And, and our sm smart engineers at Confluent implemented that and contributed that to Kafka. So you can read all the details in the code. Um, as an end user, I don't care about that. I know that there is a transaction manager and that this is implemented with different concepts like idempotent producers and others. And so this works for your mission critical workloads. And still it scales very well. That's the difference to two-phase commit transactions from databases. And so here is one of the, I think, best examples at all for this, if you, if you don't trust if this really works. So this is an example where we've built a, a transactional system from the mainframe to a modern event streaming app with KSQL in the cloud. Here you see the architecture for that. So on the right side, we see Kafka like we're talking about this in this uh, a presentation today. In this case, on controlling cloud in a serverless way. So here you have a KSQL DB app, which consumes and processes data in real time. With exactly one semantics, it's just turned on, right? Like I explained on the last two slides. But in addition to that, on the left side, you see how you can also even consume data from a mainframe. And the mainframe has its own transactional systems like IMS and Kix under the hood. So this is the transactional concepts of a mainframe. They are proprietary and they are really complex also. Um, and, and the point here is that in this example, we use another third party tool. This is one of our partners. This is BOS software with, with their middleware tool TC Vision. And their main expertise is in mainframe integration. So what they provide is an integration between mainframe systems and Confluent. And here you see that on the left side, they use Kix mainframe transactions to integrate with the mainframe. And on the right side, you see that they implement Kafka exactly one semantics under the hood. In their case, they are not using the Java API, but librd Kafka, which is the C and C++ client Confluent provides as open source library. And with this, we have now an end-to-end -end transactional integration with bidirectional integration and secured referential integrity between the mainframe and the KSQL app on the other side. And still low latency and high scalability. And I think this is a super cool example to show you how even different transactional systems like the mainframe with Kix transactions, two-phase commit, and with Kafka on the other side with exactly one semantics, how they can work together to, to build the most mission critical systems together with legacy technologies and modern cloud infrastructure. Last but not least, let's also talk about connectivity. As I said before, so Kafka is not the silver bullet for every problem. So a part of Kafka, however, is Kafka Connect which allows the integration between other systems and Kafka in both directions. So the other system can be the source or the thing or both. And with this, you can now connect all the systems like legacy applications, other messaging queues, but also modern databases like MongoDB for a document store, like Elasticsearch for a search engine, or like um, a cloud object store if you want to run your workloads on Google Cloud Machine Learning or something like that. So you're totally flexible how to connect the system with each other. The big difference, however, that is that the heart of it is Kafka, which is highly scalable and real-time at the same time. But as we learned today, because it's also a storage system, it also handles the slow consumers and handles the back pressure. Because one consumer is real-time, like an alerting system, and the data warehouse ingests the data in near real-time by taking 100 or 1,000 events at once and then ingesting it into something like Snowflake. That's how these systems were built. And then you also can have a, a batch shop in Hadoop where you do, run it only once a night with the Kafka data. And in parallel to all that, you can also have a mobile app with request response, which uses a REST web service to do a pull query on some of these values. So this is a huge advantage of using Kafka as the heart of the system and database and all its integration options with Kafka Connect. So this in the end is also thinking about turning the database inside out. And the key point here is that Kafka in the end is the heart, it's a central nervous system being real time and scalable at the same point in time and still being a storage as we discussed today. But on the other side, 
Again, it's not a silver bullet for every problem. For example, it has limited capabilities to query the data. And therefore, you can also build materialized views on top of Kafka, mainly by using Kafka Connect, but of course any other consumer also works. And then you can build your other views, for example, with a relational database or with a document store or a data lake like S3. So that's then what you can decide per use case. But still, the heart of it is the left side Kafka, because with this you can also build other applications which consume the data directly from Kafka for real-time alerting or for continuously processing the data in motion with Kafka Streams or KSQL DB. And this is what we mean with the term the database inside out concept. And this works very well actually because you don't have data at rest and wait until someone consumes it, but you really have the real-time data as the heart of this infrastructure. And with that, yeah, well, you can really build systems which are running across regions or even globally. This is streaming replication at the heart of it between different Kafka clusters, which can run on premise and in the cloud or multi cloud, or really even across regions and continents. There is several different replication technologies available. So from a Confluent perspective, of course, we support MirrorMaker 2 as Apache Kafka framework, but have additional tools for that, like cluster linking, where you can out of the box link different clusters by just using the Kafka protocol. So there is no need for additional infrastructure like MirrorMaker or a Confluent Replicator. And we also have tools like multi-region clusters, where you can even stretch one single Kafka cluster across regions like US East, Central and West. That's not possible with open source Kafka. But the point here is really you can replicate data between different Kafka clusters. And then with that in mind, of course, you can also connect all these different systems to it, like databases, data lakes, applications, APIs, SaaS applications like Snowflake or Salesforce. And so this is a super powerful approach. And the difference again to using a database at the heart of that is that the heart of this is real time and scalable with Kafka. And you, you could build a similar architecture like this, even with mainframes as the heart of it, which replicate data. You could use another system like MongoDB here in the middle on each um, sector and each region and replicate between the databases. But then you replicate data at rest and cannot connect a real time consumer to that. With this architecture, you replicate the data with Kafka in a real-time manner at scale and still can run your favorite database as a materialized view on top of that in each region. And this is the, the huge difference here. So in summary, can Kafka replace a database? Yes, absolutely it can. But as you have also learned today, it does not replace other databases. So in most cases, Kafka and other databases are complementary to each other. Kafka is not the silver bullet to every problem. So to, to summarize what I said in this talk today, I know it was a lot of content, so let's make sure you remember the most important parts. Kafka can store data forever in a durable and highly available manner with exit guarantees. So it's a database, period. And there is different options to query historical data in Kafka. It's not just about real-time consumption. You can do pull queries, you can do parries of specific time frames, and so on. So you have seen a few different examples which help here, like KSQL DB for processing data in motion, but also providing stateful status in the database in the client in KSQL. Or you have seen things like tiered storage, which make it much, much more cost efficient and scalable to implement Kafka as a long term database storage. Stateful applications are a super important part of Kafka for continuously processing the data with state, but also for providing pull queries to other clients. In many cases, especially if you more think about microservice architectures, not every microservice needs a database. Some do, some others do, don't. They can just use Kafka as database. But again, Kafka is not a replacement for other databases. There's very good reasons why SQL, NoSQL and data lakes still exist and have their value. Really think about this like I explained in this concept like turn the database inside out. It's much better if the heart of it is real time and scalable with Kafka and then you also 
uh, put views on that data at rest with these kind of databases. So in summary, everything complements each other, right? Choose the right technologies for your use case. Ask yourself, what's my business problems? What's my long-term strategy with that? And then you can build the right architecture for that. And there are so many different options how to query that data. The one example I showed about Rockset was really exciting where you can query data directly from Kafka, even with ANSI SQL. So know all the options I showed you today, and then you can make the right decision for how to implement your database architecture, which often is not just one product, but a combination of different frameworks, products, and concepts. And with that, I hope you learned a lot about Apache Kafka and how you can use it as a database, how it's complementary to others. And so if you have any questions about that or want to stay in touch, please feel free to, to, to connect to me on LinkedIn or on Twitter. And so I hope you really liked this talk. Please also share feedback if you don't like something so that I can do it better next time. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.